Welcome! Today's project is installing the Darksoft CPS-1 multi-board. Uh, this will allow you to play all of the Capcom CPS-1 and CPS-1.5, aka Q-Sound enabled games, off of one donor board. Um, there's a lot to cover on this topic, so I'm just going to jump right into it. Basically, when you buy the kit, it comes with the large multi-board itself, which integrates the Q sound. I'll talk about that more in a second. It's got this, uh, they call it a filter board. It's kind of a joining board that joins the uh, multi-pin out from the smaller connector here to the longer JAMA pin out and combines them together so that the Q sound gets mixed into the JAMA um, audio. I'll talk about that more later too. And underneath we've got an LCD controller for selecting which game is going to play, um, a fingerboard that connects to the uh, filter board, um, there's a uh, pellet chip that needs to be swapped out, uh, there's a ribbon cable for connecting the LCD selector to the uh, multi-board, and then um, there's two wires. This kit does require you to solder two wires. Um, Two wires usually isn't anything too tricky to solder, but if you have any doubts about your soldering ability, then you might want to hire somebody that does know how to solder to do it for you, because you could mess up your board if you don't solder those wires the right way. Uh, but we'll be getting to that topic here shortly. All right, let's talk about the correct donors for these. Okay, the donor board I'm going to be using for the CPS-1 Multi is this Street Fighter II Champion Edition board that I've had for a couple of years now. Um, let's talk briefly about the CPS-1 architecture. So it's basically a sandwich with a long bottom board that has, does all the computing and the graphics output. Um, it's called the uh, uh, A board. The middle board is the ROM board that holds the uh, you know storage ROM data for the games. That's the B board. And then this little board on top is called the C board, and the C board was a security measure. Um, basically, this chip would vary between different games, and it handles memory mapping and graphics ROM mapping. So if arcade operators tried to swap one CPS game out for a different CPS game, but didn't have a matching C board, the game wouldn't display or boot up correctly. And so over its lifetime, Capcom had, I think I want to say, about 15 different uh, C boards. And for the very late games that came out, they switched to the uh, B21. Um, I should say the earlier ones were labeled uh, B1, B3, B5, etc. B21 was the last, and it was the only one that was allowed to be programmed from the factory. Capcom would write... Uh, configuration into this and then a battery would store the configuration you can see the spot for a battery right there and then um, that way they only had to use one uh, chip that the, they could only manufacture one chip but then they could program it to simulate the configuration of any of the earlier CPS chips and um, that allowed them to keep their manufacturing costs down but it meant that if that battery ever went dead then the C board would lose its configuration and the board would essentially suicide. It wouldn't boot up anymore because it wouldn't have compatible graphics um, and memory mapping. So anyway, this board um, I converted a while ago to uh, Ghouls and Ghosts, uh, basically a modded Ghouls and Ghosts that works uh, with a batteryless C board. And that's why I've got the reprogrammed EEPROMs here. But um, Street Fighter II Champion Edition is one of my favorite donors for the uh, CPS-1 Multi. Let me take the stack apart and I'll break down why that is. So I mentioned when you go to take the stack apart, you can just gently wiggle these connectors up and off the board. They're not screwed down or fastened down, it's just a pressure fit. That said, they are quite tight. I might end up having to turn the camera off. Oh, here we go, there we go. Yeah, so the C board lifts off just like that, and then the B board separates from the A board the same way. Just lift up on the corners until it comes apart. And you'll need to do this with any game that, because the multi takes the place of this middle ROM board. There we go. Oh, 
Okay, let me set this aside and then we'll get into what makes a good donor board. All right, so now we're looking at the A board, the bottom board of my Street Fighter II uh, Champion Edition donor. And let's talk about uh, what you need for a good donor on this multi. So um, first of all, this is a so-called short board because it's perfectly rectangular. The early CPS1 games like Strider and Forgotten Worlds came on what were called long boards. So they would be more rectangular and longer. The connector that connects the uh, middle board to the lower board won't fit if you're using a long board. So you need to get one of these short boards. Um, another reason that Street Fighter II makes a good candidate is it's got the 12 megahertz clock chip right here. Um, long story short, the early CPS games ran at 10 megahertz, while the later CPS games ran at 12 megahertz. You can run the early CPS games like Strider on a, that were meant for, they were developed for 10 megahertz, but they run fine on a 12 megahertz board. Um, I've tried Strider especially, I know very well, and I've played it both ways. And basically, when the game isn't overloaded with tons of enemies on the screen, the games run identically at both clock speeds. But when the board loads up with a bunch of enemies, like in the jungle level, the swinging vines and the bugs coming at you and everything, um, the 12 megahertz board doesn't bog down as much. It doesn't slow down when there's a lot of ec extra activity going on. So um, I prefer the 12 megahertz boards. You can use the multi on a 10 megahertz board, but be aware that some of the late games that expect a 12 megahertz um, might slow down more than you would expect. Um, I'll also mention that for the purists, uh, one of the uh, Arcade Projects forum members, uh, Derek 2K, is working on a clock mod that will allow the multi to switch the clock speed of the A board between 10 megahertz and 12 megahertz on the fly according to the game that's being run. So that option is coming up for the purists, but the time I'm making this video, the mod wasn't available yet. Okay, another thing you need to look for in your donor, you want it to um, have a fully populated sound section. There are some repurposed CPS-1 uh, small boards like this where um, the audio section originally was pulled out, just gone, and that's because they came from CPS 1.5 Q sound games originally, and the Q sound games don't use the onboard audio in the A board. Instead, all the audio is generated by the uh, Q sound board, and so the A boards um, would be rescued from failed CPS 1.5 games, and then the sellers would fill in some of the bits, <laughs> some of the missing uh, audio section bits, but sometimes not all of them. So anyway, take a look at the uh, lower left corner of the board down here by the volume dial. That's how you know it's the audio section. And you just want to make sure that you've ever, all these components that you see here are present and accounted for. One more thing I wanted to mention really fast is that um, this chip in the upper middle of the A board is the graphics custom. I don't remember the part number off the top of my head. I'll overlay it on top of the video. But this chip um, is responsible for drawing the graphics and they are known for having a high rate of failure. So I like to just put a passive heat sink on them. There's no guarantee that that will help lengthen their lives, but it doesn't hurt either. I figure the less heat that builds up on them, the better. So um, that's just something I like to do with all of my CPS-1 boards. And I'll put a part number for that heat sink um, in the show notes. All right, let's talk Q sound really fast. So as I mentioned, um, most CPS-1 games, about 29 or so of them, um, use uh, audio hardware that's down here on the A board. There are six CPS-1 games, so-called CPS-1.5, where uh, Capcom used a whole intermediate board to generate Q sound powered by a Q sound custom chip. This is a dead donor. This used to be a copy of Punisher, and um, it's, it fell on hard times. It hasn't worked in years, but anyway, um, so yeah, Capcom used to have an, a, a whole separate board. So instead of A, B, and C, you'd have A, B, C, and D, where you'd have the bottom board for uh, processor and graphics, then you'd have the Q sound board, then you'd have the ROM board, and then you'd have the C board in a quadruple stack. And um, the Darksoft Multi 
builds the functionality of the ROM board and the Q sound board into one board. So you can see that the uh, audio pinout right here and the custom Q sound module are both present on the dark soft board, along with RCA outputs uh, for stereo audio. Those are there as well. So the Darksoft Multi mixes the functionality of both the ROM board and the Q sound board all into one. Um, one quick thing to be aware of, um, there are a limited number of these original uh, Capcom Q sound parts available. So um, right now, as far as I know, all the people who have received theirs have had the original Capcom part, but Darksoft has said that um, once he runs out of them, then um, the later multi boards will come with an FPGA that will function identically. All right, let's talk C boards really fast. As I mentioned, the C board was used by Capcom as a um, protection mechanism, and it uh, does memory management, and, or memory mapping, I should say, and um, graphics mapping. And so if you have the wrong Q sound chip for a game, then um, the game won't operate properly. This one's from Street Fighter II Champion Edition, and it has these additional connectors down here at the bottom. Those are kick harness connectors, and it's because the uh, JAMA Arcade Standard only supports four buttons, but Street Fighter II wanted to have six buttons. And so the um, extra buttons for player one connect here, and the extra buttons for player two connect here. And you'll see the dark soft board integrates those kick harness connectors there on the right hand side. So looking at the corner of my C board here, this part number doesn't match any of the uh, valid C board candidates to use of the multi. So I went on to eBay and ordered one that would work. Um, in this case, it's 92641C-1. If you Google the seller uh, sheep underscore Nova, he sells these for $30 a piece. And um, one, as far as I know, I think he's selling them so they're ready to work with the multi as it is right now. Um, it used to have a battery originally from Capcom, but he removes them. And then the other just key detail to look for is it needs to have these pins um, soldered down to ground. Um, on some of the earlier variants, like I've got this other one that was ordered a while back, you can see there's a patch wire running there, and um, those pins are not soldered to each other and soldered to ground. Um, if you have one that's like this, you will need to remove that wire and fix the uh, soldering on those so that those pins are tied together. But this one should be all set to drop in and go. Uh, first things first, you want to make sure that your donor works before you start. Uh, technically, you won't be, I won't be carrying over the B board or the C board in this case. Only the bottom board uh, will be used. But um, you know, you still want to. Ideally, you want to have a game that works before you take everything apart. So um, I went and put the sandwich back together, and let's just try it real quick. So I'll turn that on, and it looks a little weird in the background while it's starting up since this is a conversion. All right, now I'll put in a quarter. So we've got sound, we've got music, we've got sound effects. Background graphics look fine, sprite graphics look fine. Make sure my controls work. Crouch and jump. Okay, yep, so this board's in good working order, so. Shut down. And uh, the next step will be to remove the B and C boards from the top A board. I'm gonna go ahead, well, I covered how to do that earlier, but basically just lift it at each of the corners, like so. All right, I flipped the A board upside down because the next step is going to be to solder the two wires that are included with the kit. There's a red wire and a green wire. And the red wire is used for the reset signal. The multi will send a reset signal down to the A board when you change games uh, so that the new game boots up properly. 
and uh, the green wire is used to control audio. It swaps the sound system between um, using the um, uh, audio components in the A board for CPS-1 games or the Q sound audio for the CPS-1.5 games. So each of these wires have to be soldered to specific points on the A board. The reset wire, if you look left from the JAMA connector, look for this little rectangular um, array of pins right here. It's gonna solder, you skip a row down to here and then look at this smaller patch of five pins here and it's gonna solder to this leftmost pin. So this red, the red wire will connect right there. So I'm gonna go ahead and solder that off camera and be right back. All right, I've got my reset wire soldered into place, so now it's time to do the uh, Q sound wire. So you wanna go off to the left from where the reset wire is, look for another rectangular pin array right there. Go down just from the corner of it and you'll see that this second row of pins, you want the third pin over from the right. So the green wire is gonna solder to that pin right there. So once again, I'm gonna do that off camera and I'll be right back. Okay, I've got the A board flipped back upright with the newly soldered wires just hanging off the bottom there. The next thing to do is we need to take this um, PAL chip that's at position 9K. You see it's labeled 9K PRG1. Uh, it's about, yeah, just a little bit right of center on the board. We're gonna to need to remove that chip it's socketed so it'll lift out easily and then replace it with the uh, PAL chip that's included with the kit. So you can take just a little jeweler's flathead screwdriver and carefully lever it in between the chip and the socket. See I've got a little bit of a gap there and just kind of wiggle it, wiggle it out. There's one side, swap hands here. other side and then might lift the left side a little bit more kind of back and forth in this case <laughs> there we go and just want to be careful that when you're lifting it up with the screwdriver that you don't you know, gouge down into the board. So just make sure you're keeping the screwdriver kind of straight in and just prying up a little bit to work it out. Okay, so now that's out, I'll grab the replacement pal that comes with the board. And you'll, if you look, you see that there's a little dot in the upper right hand corner, in this case, of the uh, pal chip. And that dot needs to match up with the notch, the little circular notch right there on the left side of the socket. So I need to turn this around so the dot's facing the right way. And then just make sure you got all the legs lined up properly, that you don't have any legs sticking out of the socket or anything. And once you've got it positioned and lined up, just press it firmly down into place. Just like that. A little bit more on the right side. There we go. Okay, on to the next step. Okay, I've set the A board aside and now I've pulled the uh, multi board, the dark soft multi board out. The next step is going to be to take the C board and connect it to the C board uh, connector on the multi. This C board is ready to go. Um, you'll notice that it's got notches on the connectors that line up to the gaps on the connectors on there so you can't install it backwards do it off camera but i'm going to put my hand behind this part of the board to support it and then i'll use my other hand and press the c board firmly into place so let me do that I'll be right back okay the, now i've pressed the c board into place and this will be how it looks once it's fully seated you shouldn't see much of a gap between the gray um c board connectors you know, you should see them pressed all the way down to uh, the multi-board, like you can see through the gap right there. 
All right, on to the next step. Okay, the next step is to install these plastic white spacers uh, that come with the kit into this hole here and this hole here, but you actually want to do them on the underside of the board. So I'm going to flip the board over and attach them there. There's a third hole here that you'll want to leave alone. That's for future use. Um, there's one CPS1 game that uses a spinner, Forgotten Worlds, and Darksoft will eventually be bringing out a uh, spinner adapter for the people that want to play Forgotten Worlds with a spinner, and that's what that uh, support hole will be used for. But meantime, um, yeah, you'll just take these two spacers and press them into place from the underside. Okay, here's a quick view of what the spacers look like from the bottom side after you've attached them. All right, I've placed the A board back on my desk and now I'm gonna take the multi board and we're going to fit the two of them together. So the connectors are at the corners. I'm gonna try to do this on my camera. Let me line it up here. There we go. So you're gonna to wanna to line up each of the four corner connectors and then press it down into place and just use your thumb and fingers to kind of press everything together. Okay, that should do it. And then you're going to take the wires the green wire is the Q sound wire, and it's going to connect to the Q sound header right here, like so. And then the red reset wire is going to connect to the reset pin. There we go. And so now we have the reset and the Q sound wires hooked up to their pins. The dash pin will be used for the clock mod I was talking about earlier. Once that clock mod becomes available, the dash line will be what switches the board between running at 10 megahertz and 12 megahertz, but for now it's unused. I just wanted to show real fast that there is enough slack in the red cable that you can kind of pull it off to the side and give yourself enough of a clearance gap to get to the micro SD card slot there. I was also going to show, looking at the gap between the boards, you want to make sure that the white connectors from the multi-board on top are pressed all the way down against the A-board base connectors, and then you can see the two spacer boards supporting the multi-board, as I mentioned before. Okay, the next step is to connect the filter board, the board that uh, brings in the Q sound output, and mixes it with the uh, JAMA board output. So um, this is, it does take some force to press these together, but you basically want to make sure that both the bottom connector and the bottom, excuse me, both the top connector and the bottom connector are lined up inside the female headers correctly, and then you'll press it firmly into place. And once it's done correctly also, the RCA ports will poke out from the hole right there in the filter board for them. So let me go ahead and install that off camera. Okay, so here's what the underside of the board looks like once the filter board is connected. And there's the audio out ports. Um, as you can see, it's down pretty much as far as it's going to go. And then on the top side, you can see the connector is on again as far as it'll go. So that's what you're aiming for. Next, you want to take the fingerboard that's included with the kit and install it into the outside facing female JAMA connector on here. Notice there's an edge that says JAMA top and JAMA bottom. So naturally you want the JAMA top side facing out and or facing up. JAMA top should be facing up and the notch should be facing to your left towards the audio out ports. And again, I'll have to do this off camera, but you'll use one hand to brace the filter board from the back and then you'll press the fingerboard firmly into place with your other hand. So let me do that off camera and I'll be right back. Okay, so now the fingerboard is pressed all the way into place. One thing I'm gonna point out is that there are kick harness connectors here 
or they're actually labeled player three or player four. Um, there are some CPS one games that will play three or four players that will use those like Captain Commando. Um, uh, but you can also use them for kick harness on uh, Street Fighter two. But with the filter board, those are not connected anywhere yet. They just um, have corresponding headers on the other side. The idea is that at a later date, you'll be able to purchase a patch harness that will go from the kick connectors over here across to there so that when you put the whole multi-assembly into a case, you'll have access to those from the outside of the case. So uh, for now, if you go to play three or four player or if you decide to uh, play Street Fighter, make sure you connect your connectors up uh, to the pins on the multi directly. Okay, the next step is to connect the LCD selector. Uh, this will print the title of the game that you have up and running right now, and you can use the up and down buttons to cycle through the list of games, and then the bottom button to select the game that you want to play. So uh, you'll want to re remove this protected film that's on the screen, and then the connector, the ribbon connector, is keyed. So there's a notch there that corresponds to the connector on the ribbon. So I'll go ahead and line that up and press that into place of my thumb like that. And then the other end, I got my, uh, <laughs> I've got my board upside down from how I had it oriented before. But again, um, it's by the SD card slot and where the wires hook up. Um, this is the connector for the LCD. So you just line that up with a notch and press it into place. And uh, I'll have to work out some kind of uh, case to get this out of the way later, but some people like to run this outside of their cab so that they can um, select games without uh, having to open their cabinet up. Okay, the next step is to prepare a micro SD card with the uh, CPS1 multi-ROMs. Be aware that uh, you'll want to search out the uh, Darksoft multi-specific CPS1 ROM pack. You can't just use the main CPS1 ROMs because they have to be um, processed in a special way for the multi to use them. All right, I've taken a 32 gigabyte micro SD card, placed it into a card reader, and then plugged it into a USB port on my Windows laptop here, and it's showing up as drive letter D. Um, typically, if your card is 32 gigs or smaller, you should be able to format it as FAT32 just uh, with Windows by itself. You can right-click on this here and then go to Format, and then you'll want to make sure that FAT32 is selected as the file system. If you don't get FAT32 as an option in here, you might need to use a uh, different program instead. There's a program you can download called let's see the SD card formatter and when you run that it gives you a window that looks like this where again you'll make sure you have the correct card selected letter D it will show your capacity here set it for a quick format and then let it do its thing takes just a moment and there we go and again as long as it says your file system is FAT32 then you're good to go if you end up with anything different than FAT32, like EXFS or NTFS, it's not going to work with the multi. So when you go and download the ROM pack from the internet, the only thing we need to extract from it is the games folder. So I'm going to extract that to the D drive, and we'll let that go. Okay, the games have finished extracting to the micro SD card, so now the last step is to sort them. Windows writes the games to the card kind of in a pseudo-random order, not necessarily alphabetical order. And when you go to browse the game list with the multi on the LCD selector, it lists them in the order they're written to the card. So you'll want to run a program called Fat Sorter that will reorganize the way the, card, the files are written on the card into alphabetical order. So I've downloaded it and I've already installed it. Here's Fat Sorter. And when you open it, it's going to ask you what folder do you want to sort. So I'm going to click Browse, and I'll choose the Games folder on my USB drive. And you do want Process Subfolders, and then we'll hit Sort. And once that finishes, 
we'll be ready to take the card out of the computer and put it into the CPS1 multi. All right, my micro SD card's loaded, so I'm gonna go ahead and slide it into the SD card slot. Latched it into place. And now we should be ready to try it out. One more thing I just remembered that you wanna check before you power up the CPS1 multi for the first time is the dip switch is on the A board. Um, ideally, you wanna have all of them turned off, and that's because different CPS1 games use different uh, settings on those dip switches. So there have been reports of some people where they thought a game had crashed or wasn't starting up correctly and it's just because um, the game used one of the dip switches to, as a pause function so the board was pausing immediately um, when the game launched. So um, I know these are difficult to reach um, with the way the multi is set up right now. There is going to be a mod available soon that will attach an extension to those dip switches and make them available um, more easily. But um, for now, it's I should have done it before I put the uh, boards together, but um, go ahead and make sure all those dip switches are turned off, um, you know, ideally before you put the middle board on, but definitely before you turn it on for the first time. All right, I've got the uh, multi turned on. Uh, I came up initially with nothing programmed, so it just booted up to a black screen, but I had to use the selector to select a different game. And uh, once I selected 1941 and told it to go, it came right up. So that seems good to go. Let's go ahead and try a different game out here. Uh, try Cadillacs. So it is erasing the flash now. And the screen will look scrambled while it erases the flash. That's normal. And from what I've seen, it takes about a minute or so to erase and then program a new game. So I'm going to pause the video and then we'll check back once it's done. All right, it finished changing games. And so now we're on Cadillacs and Dinosaurs, as expected. Um, let's go ahead and just make sure things work. I'm not hearing any sound, and I'm sure it's probably just because we have the volume turned down. The volume dial is right here. There we go. So this is a Q sound game, Cadillacs and Dinosaurs. So since we're hearing music and getting sound effects, that's how we know the Q sound part of the multi is working properly. If you weren't getting Q sound, you'd want to double check that Q sound wire and make sure that it's soldered to the right pin on the board and that it's uh, connected to the uh, multi on the correct pin header. All right, let's change one more time here. Let's go to sure, Captain Commando. So I'll mention also that the first time I powered it on, I didn't get anything. But once I went and kind of squeezed around all the corners again, made sure that everything was extra tight, it worked fine on the second try. So that might be the case of you as well. Um, there's also a status readout here, the top green light. Oh, keep in mind, I've got this upside down, so it would be the bottom <laughs> green light if you're looking at the board right side up. Anyway, if it, you see two lights, it's programming the flash right now. If you only see one light, like it just switched over to one light now, it finished switching over to Captain Commando. Then uh, one light means that it's just running the game normally, two lights means that it's programming a new game. Captain Commando uses the normal CPS audio, not the Q sound. And it does sound like it's working correctly. Yep. I think we should be good to go here. Okay, now that we're at the end, let's go over a few troubleshooting things. If you turn on your kit for the first time and don't get any picture activity, um, in my case, I had to select a game off the selector and tell it to flash it for the first time before anything would come up. And I think it's just because the kit probably shipped blank and you have to program that initial game. If it still comes up blank, you know, go ahead and make sure everything is squeezed together firmly on all four corners. 
and uh, make sure that your uh, JAMA filter linking board here is connected firmly and tight. Sometimes it can shift a little bit loose when you're, uh, it can shift things loose when you're connecting your super gun or your cabinet harness connector. So make sure that it's tight on the top and bottom. Um, check your dip switches. Make sure all the dip switches are set to off. Um, some games might lock on a black screen um, at startup to, if uh, the, the dip switches are set a certain way. So just leaving them all off is a good troubleshooting measure. Um, another troubleshooting thing to be aware of, if you're cycling through games on the selector and they don't come up in the correct order, take your micro SD card out, go back to a uh, Windows computer and run the fat sorter program on the games folder. That will go through and reorganize the way the files are organized on the card so that um, the multi pulls them up in the correct order. Um, as far as music and sound goes, notice there's a hole cut out here on the top board uh, to get to the volume dial on the A board underneath. The A board still generates the music and sound for the regular CPS1 games, and so you'll use that volume dial to adjust volume for those games. And the Q sound games um, are, have their audio generated by the Q sound equipment, and this volume dial only adjusts the sound for the Q sound games. Likewise, these RCA ports um, are only used for stereo audio on Q sound games. The regular CPS1 games will not put any audio out for those ports. Um, the JAMA um, connector uh, is mono. And CPS1 games were designed to generate mono audio through JAMA. This uh, filter mixing board will also take the Q sound audio, mix it into mono, and send it out on the JAMA as well. So if you're only using JAMA mono audio, you will get sound for both CPS1 and Q sound games. But um, if you're using stereo, then you'll only get stereo audio for Q sound games. And uh, I think that's pretty much everything. So uh, enjoy your CPS1 multi. I know I will. I plan on playing a couple of hours of video games here once I'm done filming. And uh, I'll see you next project.